can stop the Lord Almighty? Sing it out. Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord? Who can stop the Lord? Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord? Our God is the Lion, the Lion of Judah. He's roaring with power and fighting. Every knee will bow before Him. Our God is the Lamb, the Lamb that was slain for the sins of the world. His blood breaks the chains. Every knee will bow before the Lion and the Lamb. Oh, every knee will bow before Him.
you go. There you go. I remember that this is always an exciting place to be. It's good to hear your singing again. It's good to see you. Uh, thank you for your invitation. Um, this is a privilege that I, I don't take casually. I've lived in Alliance, Ohio now for almost four years. Alliance, Ohio is uh, billed as the birthplace of the scarlet carnation, the state flower of Ohio. It was developed by a botanist by the name of Dr. Levi Lanborn in 1866. And because of that, we have a carnation festival every year. And as you walk the streets of our town, especially as you cross the streets, you see that there are red carnations that are painted in the crosswalks. It's very pretty. In fact, most of the red carnations are along Union Avenue and State Street, which are our north and north, south, and east, west arteries in town. And it's my route that I actually walk to my favorite coffee shop every Monday. My favorite coffee shop is called Esso. It's owned by two young men who choose the choicest coffee beans to roast, then grind, then brew via the pour-over method into the perfect cup of coffee. Mine, no sugar, no cream, just black, the way coffee should be. And so on Mondays, often I will go in there and get a cup of coffee, and if it's a nice day, I'll walk outside, just like I did the one day with my fresh cup of Guatemalan, walked out onto Union Avenue and looked across the street at the University of Mount Union campus, where it was kind of all of a hustle, where the year was starting to begin once again. A lot of feet have walked upon that campus since 1846. Our 25th president, William McKinley, as well as NFL coach Dom Capers and many others. And if you turn north, passing the university campus, you come into a, a little downtown section that used to be just a little bit more busy. But there's still a few shops there. And in this row of four, there's a sign on the second one as you look up. And you can see that the sign has been painted several times. It's a wooden sign. It, you know, the layers are kind of peeling off at the edges, and you can see several layers of paint. And as you're going northbound, you, you look at it, and it says, we buy junk. But if you see the reverse, it says, we sell antiques. And I like antiques, so I go in. And inside, there's a curmudgeonly old man perched atop a high stool reading a book behind a counter through his little half glasses. I smile at him to greet him, but he doesn't, he doesn't respond. But I'm not there to see him. I'm looking for treasures. Beyond the counter is a red velvet love seat. To its left, a silver tea set on a coffee table. To its right, an old wooden trunk with brass hardware. Now, many times in an antique store, the best finds are always hidden, so I approach the trunk. I open it up, and I see the most gorgeous purple velvet that I've ever seen. And I wonder, has this been put here? Was it original, or was it done during a refurbishment? And as I I brush my hand across the velvet and I feel the fibers underneath my fingernails. My finger notices an irregularity in the side of the trunk. And, and as I investigate it with my hand and my thumb, I, I notice that it's, it's, it's metal and it's a disc. The disc, it's a button. So I, I press the button and lo and behold, the trunk has a false bottom and there's a little compartment that opens. And inside the compartment, I see some papers that are all bound up in some ribbon, some faded pink ribbon. And I look at the man, he's still immersed in his book, and so I take the papers. And there's a high wing back chair to the side that's facing away from the counter, and so I sit down and I take a look. I wrap the papers, and I can see that they're letters with very, very fine, fine penmanship. The dates. These 20 or 30 letters seem to be from 1861 through 1862, and maybe a few around 1863. They're written to someone only said, my darling. 
and signed Julia. And as I look through the letters, it looks to be a wife that is writing to a soldier, probably a Civil War soldier, obviously misses him very much. She mentions people like Johnston and Buckner and Sherman and places like Vicksburg, Belmont, and Shiloh. Well, this is definitely a very historical item. I, I wish I knew more, but about that point, the man clears his throat. So I'd better put his things back. So I go over, I put the letters back into the compartment, I close it. I reach up, I, I grab the trunk to close the lid, and I notice with my left hand another irregularity. I almost have to stand on my head to look under the, under the latch facing, and I see letters that are burned into the wood. It says, U. S. Grant, Army of the Potomac. Well, this is some trunk. It's no wonder the price on the handle. That little cheap white tag. I mean, somebody made a mistake selling this thing to this shop. They buy junk. Yeah, right. This guy's really going to make a profit. Because the tag says $9,500. This is the opportunity of a lifetime. Leonard Ravenhill once said that opportunities of a lifetime must be seized within the lifetime of the opportunity. This morning, I have come to talk to you about an opportunity of a lifetime. But I believe that for several of you that are sitting here this morning, the Holy Spirit's already talked to you about it. I do not believe I'm the first one to bring it up. Now, on a Sunday like Faith Promise, you're probably thinking, oh, he's just talking about the money that I'm going to pledge to missions. No, that's not what I'm here to talk to you about. Pledging money to missions is a wonderful thing, but you see, if the Holy Spirit has talked to you about the opportunity that I'm here to talk to you about, mm, money is a very fast way and a cheap way <laughs> to live in denial about what the Holy Spirit has already told you. You see, I'm here to talk to you about an opportunity that money cannot buy, nor can it fend off. I'm here to talk to you about your life. I'm here to talk to you about you giving your life for your entire lifetime to Jesus, to the call of ministry. If you take out your inserts this morning that were supplied to you, there's some fill in the blanks on there. It will be very easy for you to follow with me this morning. First blanks are under something called the point. I'm going to tell you the point right up front. Let's fill in the blanks of the point together, and here it is. Jesus calling you to ministry is the opportunity of a lifetime, even if it makes no sense to you and those you know. Jesus calling you to ministry is the opportunity of a lifetime, even if it makes no sense to you or to those you know. If you have a Bible this morning, would you turn with me to 1 Samuel chapter 3? This is the account of the call to ministry for the prophet Samuel. Now, Samuel is a special character, person in the history of ancient Israel. Samuel's mother's name was Hannah. Hannah was not able to have children. And she did not have Samuel until she was well along in years. In fact, she was quite old. She prayed for years and years and years that she would have a son. And the Lord gave her grace and she had Samuel, her only son. The Bible does not record that she had any children after that. And when Samuel was born, after a few years of his life, Hannah made a decision that made absolutely no sense at all. She took this little boy, took him to the tabernacle where the Ark of the Covenant is, 
and where the priest of God was, Eli, and gave the little boy Samuel to Eli for God's service for his life. He never came back home with her. He stayed at the tabernacle ministering with Eli and the priests there. This is his call to ministry. Still a small boy, 1 Samuel chapter 3, starting with verse 1. Now the boy Samuel was ministering to the Lord in the presence of Eli, and the word of the Lord was rare in those days. There was no frequent vision. At that time, Eli, whose eyesight had begun to grow dim so that he could not see, was lying down in his place. The lamp of God had not yet gone out. And Samuel was lying down in the temple of the Lord where the ark of God was. Jesus calling you to ministry is the opportunity of a lifetime, even if it makes no sense to you or to those that you know. The first of the accompanying signs of a call to ministry that we see in this passage, and you can fill in letter A under if, is this. That you are around the people and the things of God. You are around the people and the things of God. Here's Samuel, given to Eli at the tabernacle where the Ark of the Covenant is, where all of the ministry before God goes on. He's already there, night and day. He doesn't just go to worship, but he's there in the presence of God constantly. Here you are. It's not uncommon for you to hear a message from this place. It's not uncommon for you to walk into this house. It's not uncommon for you to be among God's people, among the things and the structures that are dedicated to the ministry of the gospel. You're among the people and the things of God. You see, that's a position that you're in. Not every person in this town is in the position that you're in this morning. Not every person is able to be hearing what you're hearing this morning, specifically a message from God. You didn't wake up this morning going, I'm going to hear from God. No, that's not what you said. <laughs> Nobody comes into the church and saying, well, today I think I'm going to be called into ministry. Nobody says that. It was the same for me. When I was called into ministry at age 15, I was at a camp meeting where I had grown up since I was an infant. It was a Thursday night. I, I remember it like it was yesterday. A missionary was speaking. It was a missions emphasis, kind of like what you're doing today. I was sitting in an open-air tabernacle on the left side, facing front. I don't remember what the message was about, but I remember it. I remember being spoken directly to. I was around the people and the things of God. I was in a position where I could hear a message from him. So are you. You see, it's not by coincidence that you've been put in the family that you're in. It's not by coincidence that you were born here. It's not in a coincidence that you're in this room, in this church, in this place, that you're here. Jesus put you in a specific spot for you to hear something. You're around the people and the things of God. Moving on, verse 4. Then the Lord called Samuel, and he said, Here I am. And ran to Eli and said, here I am, for you called me. But he said, I did not call you. Lie down again. So he, Samuel, went and lay down. And the Lord called again, Samuel. And Samuel arose and went to Eli and said, here I am, for you called me. But he said, I did not call you, my son. Lie down again. Jesus calling you to ministry is the opportunity of a lifetime, even if it makes no sense to you or to those you know. Let it be. Here's the second sign that we see in the passage. There is a voice and or stirring that you cannot ignore. There is a voice and or stirring that you cannot ignore. Here's Samuel. He's laying by the Ark of the Covenant in the tabernacle in the part that they would call the temple of God. He hears a voice. He's not sure who the voice is. He knows he's heard a voice. So he gets up and he goes to the only other person that's in the tabernacle. The priest, Eli. The man that pretty much fathered him. Probably wouldn't have been rare for Eli to call for Samuel in the middle of the night, especially if he's blind. 
You think that Samuel probably thought that Eli was playing a practical joke on him. Samuel, here I am, Eli. What do you need? I don't need you. Go and lie down. What's going on here? You know, I remember listening to that missionary on that Thursday night and thinking, hmm, I've never heard a message like this. I've never heard anybody talk about the call to ministry, but for some reason, this just seems really familiar. I've never really had anybody come up and talk to me about it, but I just, it's something, something about this just isn't right. I felt sick. I felt troubled. I felt like he was talking to me and I didn't know him from Adam. What's the deal? I had a voice. There was a stirring within me already. I couldn't ignore it. I couldn't walk away from it. I wanted to get away from it. I wanted to turn the other way, but it, it, it wasn't happening. It's the second sign that you might be called into ministry. There's this voice, there's this stirring that even while I'm talking right now, you know it's you. You can't deny it. You might try to hide it. Oh, but let's go on. There's a voice or stirring that you cannot ignore. Verse 7. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord, and the word of the Lord had not been yet revealed to him. And the Lord called Samuel again a third time. And he, Samuel, arose and went to Eli and said, Here I am. You called me. Then Eli perceived that the Lord was calling the boy. Therefore, Eli said to Samuel, Go lie down. And if he calls you again, you shall say, Speak, Lord, for your servant is. Hears. So Samuel went and he laid down. That third sign that there might be a call of ministry upon your life is this. That the voice or stirring is reinforced by someone you know. The voice or stirring is reinforced by somebody that knows you. You see, this is what was going on the third time that God called, and Samuel gets up, and he might have even just thought, what in the world, Eli? Can I not go to sleep? Can you not leave me alone? What do you want? You know, people that know us, and this is why it's so important to be connected in the church and to have relationships in the church, is because there are things like the call of God, like your spiritual gifts and other things like that, that must be affirmed and reinforced by somebody else. You might have maybe mentioned something to someone. You have, I'm having these feelings. I'm having this stirring. I, I don't understand what's going on here. And that person, and they're going to be a Christian. They're going to know the Lord, and they're going to know you well. They may have said to you this. You need to pray about that. Don't ignore that. Maybe you need to fast. Mm, I'd go to the altar and spend some time on that one. Oh, have you read this book? Most of the time, that person that knows you and has reinforced that voice also gives you a little bit of advice, and that advice lines up with the word. Jesus calling you into ministry is the opportunity of a lifetime. Even if it makes no sense to you or those you know, that voice or that stirring is backed up and reinforced by somebody that you know, and that's exactly what happened here to Samuel. Eli caught on. He counted one, two, three. Three is a big number in the Bible, especially in the Old Testament. Of course the priest in the tabernacle caught on to that. This is the third time the boy got up saying the same thing. See, in Hebrew culture, if a person is speaking and they say something three times, it means they're really, really, really trying to get your attention. Yet if you fast forward all the way to the book of Revelation where the, where the angels are saying, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, what they're really saying is they're saying, holy, 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 times infinity. That's what they're saying. Here's Samuel. He's getting up. Here I am. Here I am. Here I am. Here I am. What do you want? You called me call of God is an infinite call. Once he places the call, he doesn't withdraw it. And right there, one, two, three, it added up to Eli, and he said, son, go lay down. I, I can't tell you exactly what's going on here, 
But if my gut is right, just say, speak, Lord. Your servant's listening. So Samuel went and laid down. Verse 10. And the Lord came and stood, calling as at other times, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel said, speak, Lord, for your servant hears. Simple little words, but it's so difficult. To tell God yes is to tell yourself no many times. To tell God yes means that you're giving him permission to take him wherever he wants. That might mean that you might not go where you want. Speak, for your servant hears. Then the Lord said to Samuel, Behold, I am about to do a thing in Israel at which the two ears of everyone who hears it will tingle. On that day, I will fulfill against Eli all that I have spoken concerning his house from beginning to end. If you're among the people and the things of God, and if there's a voice and a stirring that you can't ignore. And if that voice or stirring is reinforced by somebody that you know and knows you well, then, letter D, respond willingly. Respond willingly to the call. And Jesus will give you a mission and a message. Respond willingly to the call. And Jesus will give you a mission and a message. See, this is exactly what happened here. And if you read on through the rest of chapter 3, what's actually going on is that God gives Samuel a message to give to Eli about Eli's house. It's not a good message at all. It's actually a very terrifying message. But God's already told Eli about it. What he's doing is he's reinforcing and he's affirming through Samuel, a little boy that he was going to do exactly what he said he was going to do. <laughs> I remember sitting in the open-air tabernacle when the missionary was speaking. I just remember feeling sick. I remember feeling like, I know it's me. I remember thinking about standing on my Grandma Groover's porch. It was a porch that had a real high rail on it when I was a little boy. She was already in a rest home by this point, but I, re I remember sitting in that, in that pew. I remember standing on that porch, and I was playing church, and I was preaching, and, and she took a picture. My mom still has that picture of me on the wall. <laughs> my grandmother said, you're going to be a great preacher, Dale. And it started to make sense. And the piano and the organ started to play. I didn't know what else to do. There was only really one thing to do. I had to respond. So I walked down the aisle. And that camp meeting has these real, real low, long white benches that they still use as altar rails to this very day. The old tabernacle had asphalt down there. It hurt your knees. I can still remember kneeling at the altar. My grandfather, who was a pastor, he knelt beside me. Two other ministers. One named Bert Dominic. Bert was our youth director then, and he looked at me and he said, Dale, are you responding to the call to preach? I said, yeah. And Bert just said, okay, let's pray. Has it been an easy road? Oh, no. 
when you respond to the call to preach, sometimes you have to deliver a message that you don't want to deliver, just like Samuel had to. But let me tell you, let me tell you, oh, I would never go back and not do it. I'd never go back and not do it. How the Lord's blessed us. How the Lord's taken us from place to place and made so many wonderful friends. How the Lord's shown us so many things, how he's taken care of us. You see, when God, when he calls you, he always takes care of you. It might be the strangest way. It might not make any sense to you. But when you look in the rearview mirror of your life and you look back and you go, I thought my goose was cooked. God took care of us. It's unbelievable. See, my friend, if you're around the people of God and the things of God and you got this voice or this stirring that you just can't ignore and you think it, I might be talking to you right now and maybe somebody else has already reinforced to you that there's some kind of ministry that you've just been cut out for, you need to respond willingly. Respond willingly. Jesus will give you a message and a mission. You see, he's given me a mission. My mission's making disciples. That, that's what the mission that I'm on. How do you make a disciple? Well, the, making a disciple, it's just like the invitation that Jesus gave to his disciples. Come, follow me. I'll make you fishers of men. Just as people have done with me before, I'm supposed to be calling men and women, boys and girls in my ministry, making them disciples. What's my message? The gospel. Jesus died and is raised from the dead. It's the greatest news that ever hit the earth. You know? Jesus dying, conquering death, that's a good one. That's good news. Because that means that there's nothing that Jesus cannot conquer. There's nothing that Jesus can't do. And if I'm his disciple, there's nothing that Jesus can't do through me. What's my mode? You see, this is where it gets a little bit different. When you're called into ministry, there's a thousand different modes of ministry. There's a thousand of them. Probably a million. My mode's preaching. I have no idea what your mode will be. You know, your mode could be like a lady that I heard not long ago. Her name's Danielle Strickland. Danielle Strickland used to be an officer with the Salvation Army. Now she's a speaker and a podcaster and an author. But in her time with the Salvation Army, do you know what she got to do? I mean, think about this. She was part of covert ministry. I mean, like, tss, don't, 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 like Mission Impossible stuff. No kidding. She would go into brothels in foreign lands and minister to prostitutes. And some of these places, she and other Salvation Army officers would go in undercover into places that were participating and, and doing human trafficking where they were keeping children, and they'd take the children back. Wow. But I'm not called to that kind of ministry. I couldn't sneak up on a mouse. Or, or maybe, maybe your mode will be like a guy by the name of Rob Dewey. Rob lives in Charleston, South Carolina, and for the past 30 years, Rob, as an ordained minister, is also a chaplain to victims and first responders of trauma. Most of the time, tragic trauma. Is there really any trauma that's not tragic? Now, his mode is he's at accident scenes and just hor horrible things. I took a, took a two-day course from him on, on uh, crisis counseling for, for chaplains. And some of the things that he told us and showed us are absolutely horrific. But that's his mode. That's his ministry. Now, my ministry is not debriefing a paramedic after the death of a child or, 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 or some of these other things that, that Rob does. But you know what? That's his mode. You see, your mode, what Christ calls you to, it's not going to look like mine. It's not going to look like Pastor Nathan's. It's not going to look like Thomas's. It might look similar, but it's not going to look identical. Why? Because you're you. <laughs> see, Jesus created every one of you for a specific purpose. And to those of you who already know I'm talking straight to you, I don't know who you are. As I've prayed about this message, I know you're in the room. I just don't know who you are. That's between you and the Holy Spirit. But as I'm talking to you, you already know. You've already had this conversation. It's already been your thought. You've already been up late at night. 
You're standing in the shower, letting the hot water run over you, and you're going, I don't want to do that. I don't want to do that. Please, God, stop talking to me. And he won't. I'm going to talk more about that tonight, by the way. I hope you come back. But if, if you're around the people and the things of God, and you have that voice of that stirring that just won't stop, you just can't ignore it, and there's somebody else that's reinforcing it in your life, then respond willingly to the call. Jesus will give you a mission and a message. Now, here's the thing. There's going to be other people in your life that are going to tell you that is the worst idea for you. You are going to throw your life away if you respond to that call to ministry. You're going to be poor. You're going to be a pauper for the rest of your life. Do you realize you're going to live in a glass bowl and let a board make decisions on how they fix your plumbing? Hello? That's what they'll say. Some of you might even have family that won't speak to you ever again. Some of you may lose friends. You know, those people that tell you that you're going to be poor if you're a minister, they're absolutely correct. They are. Come to my house. But do you know the part that they leave out of their little bit of truth that they do speak is this. What's the cost of telling Jesus no? What's that cost? What's, what's the cost of saying, no, I'm sorry, I don't want to do that. I know that you're the creator of the universe and that you know everything and that you're all powerful and you know everything about me and you know me better than I even know myself and you know what, I'm just going to put my hand up to you and say no. You know, sometimes we don't say no to God that way. Sometimes this is what we say. You know, you're in your prayer closet, you're on your knees. You say, God, you do realize that I've worked my career for 20 years. I'm on the fast track. Do you know how much is in my 401k? Do you know how much is in my pension that I could lose if I do that? Do you understand the reputation that I have? Do you understand the people that I hang out with? Do you understand how good at my job I am? Listen, I know people who have a call of ministry on their life. I've been that reinforcing voice to some of them. And the ones that aren't doing that, the ones that have, you know, just kind of said, no, that's not really for me. God, you know all things. You, you get to order the entire universe except for right here, not me. I'm my own woman. I'm my own man. You know, a lot of those people, they work really nice jobs. They live in really nice houses. They drive really, really nice cars. They live in good parts of the country. They should be the happiest people on the face of the earth. But these people that I know that have a call of ministry on their life and they're just saying, not for me, they are some of the most miserable, unfulfilled people I know. You'd think that with what they do for a living and how much money they're bringing in and how they live and all of those things, you'd think that they would think, wow, am I blessed. But seriously, they are the people that I look at and go, man, they're an empty well. See, that's the cost of telling God no. And it matters not whether you put your hand up to him and say no or whether you just don't respond because when you don't respond, that's saying no to. So I encourage you, if, if you're around the people and the things of God, and there's a voice or a stirring that you just can't ignore and somebody else has reinforced it to you, then just respond. Respond willingly. Jesus will give you a mission and a message. Jesus calling you to ministry is the opportunity of a lifetime. Even if it makes no sense to you, what are those you know? You know, when I was standing in that antique store and I had my hands on U.S. Grant's trunk, man, that was the opportunity of a lifetime wow to own something like that what do you think I did of course I didn't buy that Jill would have had a heart attack <laughs> but as wonderful as that 
object was that I was touching, the opportunity, the opportunity that the Holy Spirit's already talking to you about is far, 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 far more precious than anything that you can have by inherit on earth. Jesus calling you into ministry is the opportunity of a lifetime, even if it makes no sense to you or to those that you know. And trust me, there are going to be people that are going to say it makes no sense. You could be doing so many other things. You could be making so much more money. You could be doing so many more things. You could be influencing so many more people. You know, I've had job offers to go do other stuff. I don't know if I'd be good at it, but I do know that I could probably save up more for retirement and be a whole lot more comfortable. But then I think, as I'm standing here, that back up in Ohio, in a church in Mansfield, where I started ministry at 23 years old, there is another young man who's 30. He's 10 years younger than me. And when he was 14, he started playing the guitar in a praise band. Went to college in that town, stayed in that town, worked in that town. When I left there as their worship pastor, uh, his aunt took over as the worship director. Last year, I got a call while I was doing a camp meeting out in Illinois, and, and it was this, this guy, his name's Nick Truax. And he said, Dale, I think I'm supposed to be the next worship leader at this church. I said, really? That's awesome. He was really nervous. Family fought him on him a little bit, but you know what? To be able to watch that young man grow up in Jesus and now see him in ministry and not just hang out with him as a friend, but also to get to have lunch with him every now and then or dinner with him every now and then when we see each other at state stuff, that is something that nobody could ever, 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 ever buy. I'd never want to give that up. See, that's why ministry is the opportunity of the lifetime, the stuff that you get to see. Are there heartaches? Yeah. Oh, yeah, there are. But listen, the winds are so much bigger. The winds are so much bigger. Jesus calling you to ministry is the opportunity of a lifetime, even if it makes no sense to you or to those that, that you know. You know, there are some people that are called to full-time ministry to be preachers. Some that are called to bivocational ministry. There are some that are called to foreign service. But do you know, there are also people that are called to their own hometowns. In fact, I believe that a lot of people are called to their own hometowns. They just are hesitant. Hesitant to teach Sunday school. Hesitant to get into fellowship, hes hesitant to, to step into that role. Well, Dale, I'll tell you what. You're not going to see me chaperone no youth. <laughs> Be careful. <laughs> I'm not getting on a plane. The underworld would have to freeze over before I do that. Be careful. Might not make sense to you. God's the one that calls the shots in our lives. Jesus calling you to ministry is the opportunity of a lifetime, even if it makes no sense to you or to those that you know. Would you stand with me? I pray that you would respond. Just respond willingly. What is the Holy Spirit saying to you? What has Jesus already talked to you about this morning? Let me pray for you, and then we're going to sing, and then will you come? Lord, thank you for your message this morning. Thank you for the, your word. Thank you for the example that you give us in history. Lord, I pray in the name of Jesus that my brothers and my sisters that are in this room that already knew in the middle of this message that this was for them, Lord, that they would just say yes. And Lord, it's so hard because the call to ministry, it can't be accepted just standing in the pew. We have to accept it publicly because there's really no way to do private ministry. So Jesus, would you give us boldness? Would you give us grace? Lord, we give you thanks and praise in the name of Christ. Amen. Would you respond this morning?